Well, uh, pardon us for interrupting your lunch, but uh, I do think it'll be worth your while. Um, joining us is uh, Dr. Tom Price, Secretary of Health and Human Services. Thank you. Thank you. Confirmed to that job just a little over a month ago. It must feel like a lot more than a month, uh, having been thrown into the firestorm you were thrown into. Dr. Price is an old hand at that firestorm, though. He, uh, he's been at the center of the health care debate uh, on the Republican side, at least since coming to Congress in 2005. Um, he represented uh, Georgia's 6th District in the House since 2005 until just this year. Before that, uh, you were a uh, Georgia State legislator. And before that, for two decades and more, a practicing physician, um, a, uh, an orthopedic surgeon, a professor of orthopedic surgery at Emory, and so uh, you really bring to bear what it takes to know uh, the healthcare debate. And that's really what we want to talk about today. So uh, we could hardly ask for a better guide to where things stand, uh, for a better guide to a sense of where the debate is. Everybody, I think, Dr. Price, uh, naturally would like to start with just what's going on with the bill, where does it stand, where are things on the hill. But maybe the place to start is really with the, the nature of the problem to be mm. solved. How do we think about, before we get to what this legislation is, uh, entering the position you're entering with the enormous experience you bring to bear in thinking about what healthcare policy is for, what challenges it ought to meet, how do you think about the problem to be solved as it confronts you and as it confronts Congress and the President now? Oh, thanks, Yuval. And, and thanks to National Review for this opportunity to come join you all today. Thanks to all of you for the, for the work and the support that you've provided to really one of the stellar institutions of our, of our nation. Um, I, I think starting with, with what the context is for this discussion and then laying out the problem is exactly what, what, where we ought to begin. And uh, the context is that in, in this nation, from a financing and delivery of health care standpoint, we've got different silos of, of, uh, of delivery that occur. Uh, the vast majority of folks in this country get their health coverage through their employer. About 175 million folks get their coverage through their employer. About 55 million through Medicare, another 60 million uh, through Medicaid. Uh, and then it's about 18 million who are in the individual and small group market, or especially the individual market. And, and uh, uh, the, the, the current law, uh, the, the uh, uh, ACA that was put in place, has, has literally destroyed the individual and small group market. And you don't have to just listen to me to, to uh, uh, gain an appreciation for that. If you look at uh, the number of insurers out there, we've got uh, insurers leaving the, uh, the field in droves. Last year there were 232 health issuers in the country. This year, there are 167, loss of a third in, in, in just one year. And they're not leaving because they don't want to provide a product to somebody. They're not leaving because of the, the rules and the regulation, the difficulty of just, of just doing that. Got a third of the counties in this country that only have one issuer. Got five states that only have one issuer. You've got some counties in Tennessee and Mississippi that are destined to have no mm. issuer, no insurance uh, uh, company willing to, to write a product on the exchange market. Uh, so this is, this is uh, a, a system that is truly imploding. And what that means is that patients no longer will have access to the kind of care and coverage that, that, that they need. Uh, costs are going up, deductibles are going up, uh, access is going down, and it's only getting worse. So that's the context in which we find ourselves. So this uh, uh, process that we're going through right now is not just because somebody had a fanciful notion that, that, that there was a better way to do things. Uh, we're going through this process right now because we're trying to save the health uh, uh, coverage and insurance market for, yes, the individual market, but also save the delivery system for those who are receiving care across the continuum. So that's what it's all about, and I think when you, when you look at it in that, in that light, it, it gives you a better sense about the urgency of the matter. So let's talk about that process then. That process has started out with a piece of legislation in the House, the American Health Care Act. Um, that tries to get at uh, exactly the set of problems you've uh, talked about, tries to get at the individual market and at some of the other things that Obamacare uh, has done over the past few years. Lay out for us how you think about what that legislation does. You were yourself the author of maybe the most prominent piece of uh, legislation trying to replace, to repeal and replace Obamacare over the last few years. Really, since the moment it was enacted, you've been leading the, the fight to, uh, to do better and to uh, uproot that legislation. You look at this bill as someone who ha has been that deeply involved, has produced his own approach to this. What does it look like to you? What are the elements of the bill we should think about? And uh, how do they tackle the problem? 
Yeah, uh, I don't look at this bill um, in, 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 uh, just as one piece of legislation moving through. Uh, the plan is, is to pass this piece of legislation, which is done under the reconciliation process, and I suspect that you had some conversation about that, but there's some guardrails that you must, one must use because of the rules in, in Congress for a reconciliation bill. Uh, and then there's a phase or a part of it that includes what we're able to do at, at the department, and I'd like to expand upon that a little yeah, bit please. in just a second. Um, and, and then the third phase, which is all the other legislative things that need to be done that can't be done in the reconciliation because the rules don't allow that. So uh, two legislative phases, one regulatory phase that, that, that are so important. And what we want to do, what do we want to make certain is that we respect the principles of health care that the nation embraces. Uh, we all want a system that's affordable for everybody. We want a system that's accessible for everybody. We want a system of the highest quality. We want a system that incentivizes innovation so that we can have that highest quality. Uh, and then we want a system that allows, that empowers patients and does, through, does so through uh, accountability and transparency and choices for patients. So when you look at the, what the principles are, every step of, 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 this, of this process we need to be true to those principles and put in place and do all of the things that we can do in a, in a, in a methodical, logical, legal, constitutional manner mm -hmm. uh, that allow us to, to, to reach that end. So what does that mean for the legislation? You've got uh, various parts of the legislation, the flexibility that's so important for the governors to be able to, to, uh, uh, to define and the state legislatures to define how they're going to handle their vulnerable population, especially in the Medicaid population. Uh, the, the, uh, the tax equity providing individuals uh, in the individual and small group market the opportunity to have the same kind of tax preference purchase of coverage that, that folks who are in the employer-sponsored arena uh, do. That's in incredibly important. Uh, to look at, at uh, the kinds of things we can do at, at, from the department standpoint, uh, we've had great conversations with the governors, uh, most of whom say, just let us do our job. Get out of the way. Uh, we, we know what our constituents need. We know how unique our state is and, and what needs to be done. Alaska isn't like Florida, isn't like Arizona, isn't like Virginia. Uh, and so states need to have that, that, that ability, uh, rightful ability, to be able to fashion uh, their, their, their program for, for themselves. Um, and then uh, I, I mentioned before the, the, the issuers, the insurers who are fleeing the market. Uh, we need a significant amount of market stability, not for insurance companies, but so that patients have access to the kind of coverage that they want. And that's what we've tried to put forward already. Uh, uh, we've begun that process through some diff different rulemaking uh, 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 that we put forward to make it so that there's some greater stability in the market and that not only will, will insurers stay, but those that have left will look at it and say, oh, well, now we can get back in that market and, and, and work for our customers. So talk to us a little more about some of the things you've been doing and would want to be doing. W one of the ways that concerns about the legislation are being answered by its champions is to say, as you've said, this is one phase. There, there's more to come, uh, more legislation maybe, but especially more regulatory action that would try to fill in some of the gaps in what can be done through reconciliation or what can be done in this bill. Tell us specifically what that might look like. What would you be doing uh, it, when it comes to regulatory changes, administrative changes, if the legislation that's now going through Congress would pass to build on what it would do? Yeah, this is, this is an area where I'll, I'll, I'll kind of lay out the, the 30,000 foot view, but it's important uh, that we not get too specific because as I mentioned, we want to do this in a legal and a constitutional way. And as you and your, your, the, the folks here and, and, and uh, those who might view this understand and appreciate, uh, rules and regulations, new rules and regulations require an, an Administrative Procedures Act uh, process uh, in order to enact them. So it requires publication of the, of the proposed rule, uh, a period of time where the public is able to comment, our assessment then of those comments and a response to those comments, and then putting forward either an interim or, or, or a final rule. So that's, that's a process that has to be followed. We're not able to truncate that process. But let me just put it in context. Um, for those of you that, that read the bill, um, and I see all those hands out there, um, <laughs> for those of you that read the bill and you started marking the number of times where it said the secretary shall or the secretary may, um, if you were very diligent and very accurate, you'd get up to 1,442. 1,442 times the bill says the secretary shall, the secretary may. And Pursuant to those, those, the, uh, uh, the, those opportunities, the previous administration, in fact, put in place rules and regulations and over 5,000 guidance letters, guidance letters to 
providers, to issuers, to states, to, uh, to business, that said this is what you must do in order to comply with that law. So our job, I believe, is to look at every single one of those rules and regulations that were promulgated, determine whether or not we believe they help patients or harm patients. If they help patients, that's a wonderful thing. If they harm patients, then we ought to get rid of them through the uh, 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 Administrative Procedures Act process or, or modify them in a way through that process that, that answers the concerns of the American people. Uh, do, does it, do, do the rules and regulations or the guidance, uh, does it increase costs or decrease costs? If it increased costs, then we have to look and say, is there a reason, is there a benefit to that increase in cost that endures to the folks trying to provide the care or the people receiving uh, the care? If so, then that might make sense. Uh, however, if the costs go up for no significant benefit at all, then we've, we ought to go through that whole process and say, okay, we, we, we believe there's a better way to do this. If it decreases costs, then we ought to retain those or expand them. So that's a long way of saying that there are a lot of things, if you identify those 300 plus uh, rules and regulations, we're going to look at every single one of them. So market stabilization, yes. Flexibility, yes. Look at the essential benefits package, health benefits package, and, and, and see whether or not there are uh, areas where we might consider doing something there. Uh, what, what kind of, what kind of uh, uh, flexibility should states have for their, their Medicaid population, their vulnerable population, to say, can we make this look more like the real world? Can we make this look more like a system that is actually more responsive to, to patients at the end? All of those things we ought to be able to do uh, to, again, make it so that we have patient-centered health care, which I've talked about for years, which means patients and families and doctors making decisions and not Washington, D.C. Let's think about some of the concerns that Republicans have raised uh, in Congress in, in looking at the legislation that's now before the House. One of them actually starts from exactly where you've just uh, left off. In talking about the kinds of administrative actions you could take, you're talking about authorities granted to you under Obamacare, under the Affordable Care Act. The, the legislation that you proposed to repeal and replace Obamacare began in its very first section by repealing Obamacare, by repealing all of it uh, entirely. This legislation doesn't do that. And in fact, in talking about what you would do if it were to pass, you're saying you would use the authorities granted to the secretary in the ACA itself, in Obamacare, uh, using them after the legislation is passed to make changes. And in a sense, what you're saying is the, the, the law would continue to operate within the boundaries created by Obamacare. Um, the reasons for that have to do with Senate procedure. We can talk about that. Various other people have talked about that with these folks in the last few days. But, uh, the, the, the most essential difference between this legislation and the kinds of things you've proposed before is that it leaves Obamacare on the books. And for a lot of members, that's a place to start with concerns. How do you speak to that worry? Yeah, two points I, I would make. One is that uh, the, the legislative process dictates that you can't get ex terribly expansive or, or broadly expansive in how you're going to address that in the reconciliation process. So all reconciliation bills, as, 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 as folks know, have to, uh, have to do with uh, spending or revenue. Um, and so if it doesn't have an effect on spending or, or revenue in a very specific way, an integral way, um, then it can't be part of that legislation. So that's the reason that you can't get to some of the insurance requirements that were, that were stipulated in, in, in the law. Remember, the law that passed originally had 60 votes in the Senate. Um, and, and it had a sidecar to it that was the reconciliation that was kind of fixing up some things uh, that, that then passed in March of, of 2010. Uh, but the, the bulk of the law, the 2,700 pages, that was a normal process piece of legislation that had 60 votes in, in the United States Senate. Um, so what we need to do is, is to not just do the reconciliation, but again, that, that third phase of, of legislative activities that will require 60 votes. Uh, I think that, that once we get through this first process, I think that it is uh, very possible that we'll be able to garner some support. And then a lot of, of, the, uh, uh, of the machinations and the logistics of how the law has taken effect are solely regulatory in, 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 in the, the guidance letters that I talked about. So it, it makes perfect sense to me to, to uh, respond to the concerns of the American people who say, you've got you've to get, get rid of these sorts of things that were included in, in, in the law, go through the normal legal constitutional processes using the law as it currently exists so that you can, you can uh, modify and, and, and change it in a way that, that respects patients, uh, not the federal government in the way that the, the mm -hmm. current law is. Would you describe this then as a replacement bill that's not, in essence, a repeal bill? Oh, no, I think it's a repeal. Once you, once you uh, I mean, the onerous aspects of the legislation are, are the things that are coercive, yeah. 
um, uh, to the individual. So things that say, for example, if you don't purchase what the federal government tells you you must purchase, you will have a liability, a financial liability. Um, that, 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 just, that ought to make every American bristle. Um, that, that, that's not, that's not what, what the federal government's, from, from our perspective, the federal government's role ought, ought to be. Um, to have, to have the, 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 the law of the land from, the, from, the, from Washington stipulate uh, th this is not only what you've got to buy, this is who you have to see, this is the kind of care that you're going to receive, these are the kinds of things that we'll be doing from a rule or a regulatory standpoint that will make it so that you will have this kind of care available to you, not this kind of care. Uh, those are things that just are anathema to, to the principles of this great nation. And, and so um, once you repeal those things that are, that are, are the co most corrosive elements, You've basically done what needs to be done to get us back on track to that patient-centered health care. Mm -hmm. well, one of the other kinds of concerns that some people raise is a concern that you've had a lot of experience answering over the years, a concern about the tax credit as a way of providing people with a means to afford uh, coverage. The argument is a refundable tax credit, a credit that for people who don't have a tax liability is really just a benefit. Uh, is a new entitlement, is a new federal benefit, um, and that Republicans shouldn't be in the business of creating another entitlement when we have such enormous entitlement problems to think about already. How do you respond to that concern? Yeah, this is a perplexing one to me, you all, because we conservatives had said, have said for years, uh, many folks have said the, the employer-sponsored coverage, the tax benefit that, that employers and employees get to purchase coverage, health coverage, uh, which again is 175 million of us uh, across this great land, um, that that's, uh, um, that, that's not fair to those who aren't getting their coverage through their employer. So uh, you'll, you'll, you'll know that prominently uh, a few uh, years ago, about uh, nine years ago, there was a presidential candidate who said, we ought to take that away, because <laughs> that's not right. That's not the way we ought to do it. We ought to equalize the tax treatment of the purchase of coverage for all Americans. Um, and so uh, that didn't go too well. Uh, 175 million folks is a, is a significant constituency. So what we always did in our legislation was say, you ought to give the same kind of benefit, <clears throat> pre be able to purchase coverage with pre-tax dollars in essence, uh, for, for those who don't get their health coverage th through their employer. This is the process that brings that about uh, through, through tax credits, uh, advanceable credits, and then refundable advanceable credits. It makes no sense to me to say to all of those individuals who, who uh, um, are in that, in that uh, cohort uh, where they make too much for, uh, to be eligible for Medicaid, but not enough to be able to afford uh, health coverage, that we're going to give a tax benefit for every other individual in the system, but not for you. Uh, I don't think that's a, that, that's a, that's a place to end up. So I, th I think it's the most fair thing to do. Uh, if we want to have a debate as a society about removing the, the, the tax preference for everybody uh, to, to purchase coverage, that's a debate that might be a responsible mm -hmm. thing to do, but that's not where the nation is right now. So you mentioned those people just above uh, mm -hmm. Medicaid eligibility and, uh, and still unable to afford coverage. Is coverage the measure of success here? Is that how we ought to think about uh, w what a successful legislative move would look like? The Congressional Budget Office, as you know, this week in scoring the legislation moving through the House, projected that it would leave after 10 years some 24 million people without coverage. Um, first of all, we can ask, what do you think about that score? And secondly, is that the measure? Would, would, would this legislation be a failure if that were true? Yeah, um, I think that score defies logic. Uh, and, and I'm happy to talk about it. But no, coverage ought not be, uh, ought not be the metric that we're looking at. We ought to be looking at care. Right now, you've got uh, um, uh, literally millions of people out there who have an insurance card. They've got coverage. They're counted as having coverage. But when they go to the doctor, uh, they, uh, many of them are told what their doctor recommends. He or she says he, that, you, that you ought to do this. Uh, then they go out to that front desk that we've all, uh, all been to. Uh, and if, you, if you're in a large office, you get shunted over to that little desk on the side where you sit down and somebody says, let me see your insurance card and we'll see if you can, uh, wh how we move forward. Uh, and, then, and then you're told that's going to cost 1500 bucks for that test, 800 bucks for that test, 3000 for that test, 4000 for that procedure. And then you have to go through that mental computation and say, well, my deductible, which used to be 1000 bucks, or which used to be 1500 bucks is now 6000 or 8000 or for a family $12,000 or $14,000. And what individuals are doing right now, because of the rules stipulated by the federal government, they are saying to themselves and to their wives and their, and their husbands and their kids, I'm sorry, 
we can't afford it. So they've got a card. They're listed here in Washington as having coverage, but they have no care. So care needs to be the metric that, that, that we're looking at. Now, the way that you make it so that care can be uh, provided is that you don't dictate to folks what kind of coverage they must purchase. You've got to have an array of options. You need competition in the system. You need choices available for patients. You've got to drive down the cost of providing that coverage so that the American people are able to select something that actually works for them and they're able to get the kind of care that they need. Would you expect if the legislation now going through were passed, if, if a further phase of administrative action happened, would you expect that the, the number of people with insurance of some kind would be higher or lower in 10 years? I'm, I'm of the belief that if, if, if we use carrots and not sticks, and that we put in place a system that is actually responsive to patients, not to insurers and not to the federal government, but to patients, uh, that we can have and will have a system where there's a, there's a greater level of coverage and care mm -hmm. than there is right now. Uh, in fact, I don't have any doubt about it. I think if, if, if we allow the innovation, if, for those of you that have, have gone to your doctor recently, um, it, and, and if we were to poll you uh, and, and say, how many of you uh, still had the, 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 the guy or the gal behind the front desk turn around and reach for that paper chart and put that down and then scribble a note, and that's the chart that went, went, went through. The innovation that has been out there in virtually every single sector of our society has somehow missed significant portions of the healthcare sector. Imagine a system of, of, of health care and financing and delivery, if, if, if you would, that incorporates all this innovative creativity and, and ingenuity and entrepreneurship that is, that is infecting every single other por portion of our society, e except it doesn't in, in the area of, of financing of, and, and much of the delivery of, of health care. So yeah, we, can, we, we, we ought to be able to, to provide greater coverage for folks at a lower cost and we know that we can do it because in systems where you, where you see it being done, it works. So the, the reception that the legislation has gotten um, on the whole has not, been, uh, of, uh, has not been exactly what its champions would have liked over the past few weeks, I think it's fair to say. Um, a lot of the people who were co-sponsors of your bill in the House over the years uh, are at this point at least very critical of this legislation as it stands now. Why do you think that is, and what's your sense of where the process is headed in the House and beyond? Well, my bill wasn't a reconciliation bill. Um, if you look at the overall plan, if you look at this reconciliation bill along with the other pieces of legislation that are being proposed, whether it's to bring down drug prices, whether it's lawsuit abuse reform, whether it's purchase across state lines, all the kinds of things that, that we know that make a system work well to drive down costs and increase choices and accessibility, uh, plus the regulatory reforms that we can do, that looks pretty much like the bill that I, that I proposed and, and had the support of so many others. So we need to look at it in, in, in its entirety uh, and then and embrace it in its entirety uh, and move forward working on all three of those, those phases in their entirety uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get to the right spot. So um, I, I, I think that, that uh, if, if there's one uh, if there's one thing that, that uh, we didn't do as well as we might have done, it is, it, it is the uh, initial description of what the plan is because people began to focus just on a single piece of legislation when the plan is much broader than that. What kind of third phase bills do you think would be possible? What sort of health care legislation could get 60 votes in the Senate now? Well, I think if you, if, once you get beyond the, the, the repeal portion of this, then I think you can get some significant consensus. So a uh, health savings account, something that's been remarkably uh, supported by, by folks on both sides of the aisle, and a very expansive ability of health savings accounts to provide for all sorts of, of greater responsiveness to individuals to get the kind of coverage that they want. Mm -hmm. uh, utilization for direct patient care uh, 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 models, for example, or uh, uh, other kinds of, of, of avenues to be able to gain the kind of care that you need. Uh, medical malpractice, lawsuit abuse reform. Uh, we waste in this nation uh, somewhere between uh, um, three and four hundred billion dollars at least annually in the practice of defensive medicine. Um, it's not the malpractice rates that doctors and hospitals pay that's, that's driving up the cost of health care significantly. It's the practice of defensive medicine, which are the things that I did, and, and every physician, if he or she's honest with themselves, will admit that, that they do, and that's to make it so certain that if, they, if they're ever called into a court of law, that they can honestly look the judge and the jury in the eye and say, I don't know what you wanted me to do, because I did everything. Uh, when in fact everything is rarely necessary to either treat or to diagnose the patient. So that's a huge waste of money. And think about that number, three to four hundred billion dollars a year. 
a year. That's three to four trillion dollars uh, over the 10-year budget window that we talk about. Huge amounts of money. Uh, purchase across state lines, something the president's been really, really strong on and, 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 and I believe uh, it could have a significant effect on driving down the cost by increasing the choices and in, increasing competition for the, for the, the, the purchase of health coverage. More expansive insurance products that, that could come to the fore if they were allowed to because of the, of, of the, uh, the current constraints that exist. So there are all sorts of things. And I would ask folks to be creative. Mm -hmm. Think about what you think might help significantly the financing and delivery of our health care system. What you're thinking about are things that we need to know so that we can work in that direction. So you're a seasoned legislator. You spent 20 years in legislatures, first in Georgia and then in the House of Representatives. What do you, how do you expect this process to go from here? Given how it started, given the, the very ambitious plan to move this very quickly, what's your sense of what we ought to expect over the, next, over the coming weeks and months? Oh, I, I, I think this will get done, this first phase, and I think we'll move. Uh, we, we're already begun the second phase, and we're working through uh, the, the, the regulatory process and identifying those guidance letters that, that we believe have been harmful to patient care. Um, and then the third phase is already being teed up and as I understand it, there'll be some pieces of legislation that will come forward at the same time that will begin to, to, to move that process forward. Uh, and then we'll, the, the pieces of legislation will move over to the Senate side and, 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 uh, uh, and, and, and move forward there as the Senate works its will. a lot of changes in will. the Senate? I don't know, we'll see. Um, for folks that have, I mean, th this is a very seasoned audience, so you've, you know about uh, uh, the legislative activity and what it feels like, and this feels like a tough piece of legislation. Um, and, and, and it, but it, there's a, it's a process that you go through, and uh, I, I think that uh, I was over at the House conference this morning talking to folks. Felt good. People were enthusiastic. They had good questions and, and, and still probative questions, uh, but it feels like it's moving in the right direction. This is focused on the individual market, as you said, and on Medicaid reform, a very ambitious Medicaid reform. The biggest payer in the healthcare system, and in a lot of ways the biggest driver of the inefficiency we worry about, is Medicare. Mm -hmm. uh, and Republicans, of course, have had very ambitious ideas for how to reform Medicare. You've been one of the leading voices for it in Congress. We hear a lot less about it now. Um, should we still expect Republicans to be championing Medicare reform in the Trump years, or is that something that's been put aside? Well, think about the, the part of our healthcare financing delivery system that's imploding. And it's the individual and small group market. And it is literally, in, it, with it, within a, a relatively short period of time, of not being able to provide access or coverage and then care uh, for millions of patients across this land. That's the urgent um, need in, in, in our delivery system. Uh, so that's what needs the attention. The Medicaid system is also, we're seeing uh, significant challenges just in terms of the providers, the docs out there and others, who will not, who, who are unable to see Medicaid patients because of the rules and dictates by and large from, from the federal government. So what we've done is trained our, our sites on those most urgent needs within the healthcare financing and delivery. Uh, Medicare has, has, some, has some challenges, uh, especially from a financial standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and we need, to, we need to address those and we'll work uh, through that uh, as, uh, with the president. Uh, but uh, the, the, the key is that we want to you save... you expect the president will be interested in advancing Medicare reform? I know that the president wants Medicare to, to be there for seniors that he wants to save and strengthen Medicare uh, for seniors and ensure that it, doesn't, uh, that it doesn't fail the promise that has been made to seniors in this land. The president's very, uh, very clear on, on that. And so we'll, uh, we'll have those conversations as we move forward. Great. Well, we've got just a minute or two left. So uh, uh, we can pull back from the raging health care debate and think about the rest of your job for a moment. You run the, the largest civilian department in the government, charged with a huge range of different agencies and policies. Aside from uh, the repealing and replacing of Obamacare, what else is high on your agenda as HHS Secretary? Uh, you know, it's, it, it is a, it's the largest uh, department, uh, 76,000 employees, um, has 27 different staff divisions and, and operating divisions. Um, it's an incredible privilege to, to serve as its, as its secretary. The mission is to improve the health, safety, and well-being of the American people, and it stretches all the way uh, from, from making certain that, that uh, kids, those kids that are, are uh, down on the border, the unaccompanied children, uh, there are, there are, we are their guardian until we can find a stable situation for them uh, to the kind of preparedness and response that we do. Um, the response to Ebola, the response to Zika, the response to, to uh, um, uh, pandemic, uh, potential pandemic flus, all of those things uh, are, are charged through the department. National Institute of Health is under us, uh, the Indian Health Service, the, the, the CDC, um, all, all of the things that, that the American people know and trust so much 
to make certain that we're doing our job so that they can be uh, safe and, 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 and sleep well at night. And uh, it's just an incredible privilege. The three clinical challenges that I've put before folks to say that this is where we ought to focus some of our, our uh, significant priority, mental illness. Uh, I'm, uh, it, it, it grieves me to see what we've done in this nation to individuals with mental illness. We've transferred them over the past three to four decades from, from, from inpatient uh, uh, housing not necessarily treatment, but we've just transferred them into the criminal justice system and now they're being housed in prisons. It is, I think, absolutely irresponsible on the part of our society to do that and we need to focus clearly on that. The opioid epidemic that is destroying lives and destroying communities across our land needs clear focus and attention and, and I think uh, great leadership can bring uh, that in, into great focus. And then I'm, uh, one of the, the, the others is, is childhood obesity and I mention that because the kids who are morbidly obese right now and the number is astounding, they're not going to be health challenges for themselves and for our society when they're 60, 70, or 80. They're going to be health challenges when they're 25, 30, and 35. And so we hope to, to, uh, uh, to push forward a, a significant uh, education and, and um, um, utilize those best practices that are occurring all over the country and lift them up and, and, and share them with folks so that we can address that issue. Well, thank you. You've taken on a very daunting job, and we're very grateful that you take the time to, uh, to, to, to help us understand the healthcare debate. Let's thank Dr. Price. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.